All right. Hey, folks, this is Mike from uh, Battles of the First World War podcast. I'm here today with James Gregory returning to the podcast again for the fourth time, beating out Rob Laplander, uh, who's only been on the podcast three times. That's an inside joke because we are petty people uh, when we're not being recorded. And even now being recorded, we're still kind of petty. Um, all right. So, James, would you go ahead and, and introduce yourself uh, to us again, to, you know, for anyone who's just joining us for the first time? Sure, sure. I'm James Gregory, uh, currently a PhD candidate, University of Oklahoma. And today we'll be talking about my article on the Marines in the, at Verdun in the Toulon sector. And the article will be published uh, in the winter 2022 Marine Corps History Journal. Awesome. By any chance, do you have you don't have a link to that yet, do you? No, I mean, I can give you the link to the uh, their website and okay. it'll be it's free online, but it comes out at the end of December. OK, awesome. Awesome. I'll, I'll get that into the uh, the show notes um, when, when we release. So. All right. So, yes, yeah, so we're talking about Marines, U.S. Marines at Verdun in the Verdun sector. Of course, um, this is not during the Battle of Verdun in 1916. This is in um, 1918. Um, so, James, I guess we'll just hit up these questions here. So let's go to the beginning. Like, What brought this episode of Marine Corps history to your attention? Well, uh, this, this piece is just one that in my previous works, there's always a section about them, especially the Marines that are go through the whole war start in Quantico, they all went through the Verdun sector and it's um, a period of their, their training. And it always kind of stood out to me, one, because no one had ever really focused on writing about it, but two, it's so counter to what happens to them uh, in June when they go to Bella Wood. I mean, this is the one moment where you do have the stereotype of American in the trench, right? Most people think of World War I, trench warfare, when the reality is most American troops never stepped foot in a trench for more than a day or two. And even then it was just like the night before a battle. Correct. Right. Yep. So it's it, this, this is a uh, two, three month period where we have the second division in the Marine Corps tucked away in French trenches fighting what we would uh, think of trench warfare. And so it's, it's just so unique that I really wanted to talk about it. Plus uh, one thing we, I'm sure we'll cover with this discussion is it's such a, a moment to not only establish the Marine Corps and their reputation in World War I, but also it's a learning experience. They learn all of the tactics they need for Bella Wood moving forward, or not not so much the tactics, but the the wherewithal, the, the knowledge they'll need to survive the war. Right. And it'll be something that replacements lack and have to be taught. <laughs> so uh, it just it, just the uniqueness is what really got my attention to this that's cool and and i uh, i think you titled this the the forgotten front yes you yes. did um yeah. and it is a, a bit of a forgotten front and while you know this is the article is not talking about like any major battles or anything you know like bella wood blank mont like of course this wasn't a uh it wasn't a totally quiet sector i mean they, they were active and yeah. learning things the the hard way uh while while they were here so this is this is like a really glad that you tackled this subject because it's it's another little corner of the war that we can we can learn more about and I bet um, and I'm hoping that even hardcore United States Marine Corps uh, history buffs and history enthusiasts will will learn something from from this article. Um, yeah, I'm hoping you know we cross our fingers. It's such a hard one. Plus, uh, and I think my favorite part is the idea of the devil dogs. It did not come from Bella Wood, like most Marines think. Even the Marine Corps handbook will state that the term devil dogs comes from the Battle of Bella Wood, but that's not true. It shows up in April when they're in the middle of the Verdun sector. Uh, so even their reputation today is built upon Verdun. And that's one thing I think a lot of Marines are always surprised to find out, that Bella Wood has nothing to do with the nickname. So that's James, guys. Always, always myth busting here, which is fantastic. <laughs> but this is cool, man, because this is where I always think, you know, like the um, the reality tends to be far more interesting than you know than than the myths that that we kind of just just accept. Yeah. So 
hey, to, to hear that, that that term devil dog comes from here in this sector when the Marines were, were learning, um, were learning what the Western Front was all about and what industrial warfare was was all about. Definitely. Um, well, and I'll, I'll share my for those that want to see this on YouTube. I'll share my screen and pull up some photos so you can see the Marines in these trenches. Yeah. Um, so for those of you listening to the podcast, I apologize. You'll have to go to YouTube, but uh, yeah. You, you, um, so the, the battles of the first world war podcast, it does have a, uh, a YouTube channel often mostly neglected, but you will have that here. Uh, you can go to the YouTube channel and, and you can check out some of these, some of these photos. Yeah. yeah and some of these I, I published, I will be published in the article. Um, but some of these are also never really seen before. So I want to make sure we can get an image just to think about Marines in these right. trenches. So what are we, um, what are we looking at, at here with this one? Uh, well, this first image is just some, uh, Marines of the 20th company, uh, in the, in the trenches at Verdun. So, you, and you can see, I mean, these are generic muddy trenches with boardwalks and wooden sides and they seem pretty leisure. Which, I mean, it is a quiet sector, which is kind of the whole point of sending them there. This is a quiet sector along the lines. And this gives them the best opportunity to learn trench warfare without really a lot of the danger, right? This isn't the Somme. Right. This is a quiet... Now, the issue is these are Marines, and Marines don't go quietly. <laughs> and there were several instances and stories of the marines getting in trouble because they keep picking fights with the germans <laughs> it was like kind of an untold an unspoken truce where you know they'll see each other they'll pop a few shots off but no one really tries to kill each other the french and germans seem to have established this routine and there were multiple times where germans would be seen going to the a creek or something to get water and the marines open fire and then of course get the german artillery on them and but you know the marines really established this this moment where they're there to fight and it does end up uh, heating up a little bit moving forward wow wow yeah this trench here looks with, with the the oh, what do they call it i believe they call it re revetments the the wooden brambles like mm -hmm. kind of interwoven into the wall and everything to to retain the trench wall yeah great where did you get these photos by the way it, it, so this photo uh actually comes from the minnesota state archives okay. they were kind enough to scan it and let me use it in the publication oh, um, so they've got photo albums that are digitized so anyone can go online and see them but there's a page of images from verdun and which is rare because you know cameras weren't really allowed at the front so finding photographs of marines in the trenches is very rare okay right right Right. That was pretty much a policy to, to not have um, any any cameras, not even to keep a diary because you, yeah. um, you could give away unit information. Uh, so that was they, they were pretty strict on on stuff like that. Yeah, oh, this is great. Awesome. And for for listeners, um, again, for anyone unfamiliar, Verdun is it's in eastern France today. It you know, was back then as well, of course. Uh and of course, Verdun was the site of the the pretty titanic struggle between France and Germany in 1916, covered here on the podcast in like 14 episodes. Um, now, of course, that battle was in 1916. After that, Verdun remained a fairly active sector, but Toulon, where the Marines were sent to, this is, I believe, it's to the southeast of of Verdun, and it's. Um, and it's just as James said, it was generally regarded as more of a quiet sector. And, and again, just as James said, French and German forces would work up these, these unofficial truces where they would leave each other alone. Um, the British had a policy of not making these truces. Um, and our American boys didn't either. So, <laughs> so it, was, it was on when, when these guys showed up on the front. <laughs> Yeah, that is one thing um, that is good to mention, that the Toulon sector is large. I mean, this is not small sections of the trench network. I mean, the Marines, and this is not just the Marines. Now, the article is about the Marines, right. because I wrote it for the Marine Corps History Journal. But you got to remember, the entire second division is here on these lines. So you've got the 23rd Infantry, 9th Infantry, 5th and 6th Regiments, Marines, all scattered uh, in this large section of trench line. 
So, you know, some Marines are fighting in town, some Marines are uh, in quiet areas. There's um, one company, and I'd have to go through here to remember the which company it was. They almost saw no combat in this sector. While there's others, like the 76 company, took almost 90% casualties wow. in this sector. Man, so wow. it, it depends on where they ended up in the line. <clears throat> And uh, and I've got photos and we'll talk about it here in a bit on certain areas were more likely to have raids and, and battles than others. Cool. Now, um, was, was this the question that I was supposed to avoid? How did how did the Marines wind up in France as part of the, the second division? Was that the well, one? that one itself, it's it's a, as long as you don't mind the general answer. No, yeah. that's OK. Uh, that's OK. Basically, I mean, the the. Second Division, whenever it was formed uh, in France, uh, and it wasn't formed until about September 1917, uh, that's when a lot of the units, the uh, 9th, 23rd, and the Marines started arriving en masse, right? I mean, the the 5th Marines landed in uh, June 1917, and by July, you know, the regiment was formed. But it would take until uh, February for the rest of the 6th Regiment to show up and once they arrive, they are part of the second U. You know, Army Division, and then are started. To, or I'm sorry, are sent to the Bormont training area. And at Bormont, basically, it was far enough from the trenches that every now and then they'd send some officers to the front lines to get experience. And eventually, they needed to send the Marines in to actually have a full scale training, which is then when the Marines get sent into uh, the area of Tulum in March of 1918, because that gives them the best uh, training period. And they planned on being there for a month, but the German offensive screwed that up. And so they ended up being there until May. So three months. Wow. Now, I were they under, you know, a, a nominal French supervision when they entered yes. the, the Toulon sector? Okay. Yeah, they were uh, basically... Part of this was loaned out to the French. Um, oh, okay. They were there to relieve the French. Um, and in this period, we have, uh, you know, the French are training the Marines. The French are training the 2nd Division. So they are learning French instructions. They are working with the French in the trenches. And then they end up, and this is the period, you know, where they were, their Lewis guns are taken away and they're given the show show. Um, they are given their equipment and they're said, you know, or told here, you're going into the French lines. So this is the period where they're with the French and they remain loaned out to the French until the Murs are gone. I mean, Bella Wood, they're rushed to help the French. Right. Soissons, they're alongside the French. Uh, Blancmont, they're loaned out to the French again. And then Murs are gone is when they finally rejoin the American army. Right, right. Yeah. Cool. All right, so we've, let's see, we've discussed... We've just discussed too long, right? And why the Marines were sent there. Now we've already we've already hit on this a bit, but um, overall, James, how did the Germans react to the presence of Marines at Toulon? And because you know, as, as you just said, the Marines announced that hey, we're we're here. Um, but overall, what was the German response? Did did the Germans like? I know. Um, you know, they they typically many, many World War One histories and, and World War One unit histories, they talk about how the Germans seem to always be a step ahead of whatever unit was was coming in. And and um with with some British units, they would announce themselves like, hey there guys, you know, we know exactly which unit you are, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so uh and I know in the case of the the American 26th division down in Seychelles, the the Germans you know, wanted to go ahead and teach the Americans a, a lesson on like, you know, this is who we are, you know, you're, you're kind of getting into something way over your head here. So that's the, the Germans launched their, their big raid at, at, uh, in Seychelles in April of 1918, not, not too, too far away from too long. So was it a, was it a same kind of reaction? Um, I know the Marines were, you know, popping off at, at any Germans that they could see, but were the Germans like, you know, let's let's show these Marines who who we are so that they, you know, they get put in their place really. Quickly. Sure, sure. No. Um, now, the 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 accounts that when they got off the train to start heading into the sector, 
there was an artillery barrage. So the, immediately the first thing these Marines see when they get off the train is they have to go through an artillery barrage. Oh, Luckily, it didn't kill anyone. It, it blew up like one of the wagons and destroyed a bunch of the instruments from the 5th Regiment's band. So no one was killed, but that was the opening salvo. And from the German records, because, you know, the, the second division records, you can there's 10 volumes from the German perspective. And going through those, they didn't know it was the Marines. Uh, okay. It took a minute. It took a bit till they captured some Marines to find out that they are Marines, not just the Army. They knew the Army was there, but they weren't sure if they were American. And then they figured out, okay, these are Americans. And then they figure out, okay, this is the American 2nd Division. There's, oh, some of these are Marines. And the Germans, uh, of course, quoting one of the German uh, responses after uh, Beresh, after June 6th in Bella Wood, the report from the Germans was, the 2nd Division is yet to be tested thoroughly. So you you the Germans seem to have this, this idea of at least the 2nd Division and the Marines as they are the, the stormtroopers of the Americans. And that seems to be their their idea. Because they, back and forth for the next three months, they're going to do raids back and forth. And the Germans are never going to accomplish. They will never take a single part of the trench line. Every raid fails. The Americans... The second division, the Marines are very proud of the fact that they never lost a single section of the trenches they held, um, despite these massive raids, and we'll talk about them, uh, but with flamethrowers and the stormtroopers, things these Marines have never seen before, and they never break, they never lose a single piece of ground. Which is, you know, for for well-trained, but still, you know, fairly raw troops, new, new yeah new to this all green program. you know right. some of these have only been in, in france for a month and they've been at bormont doing drill you know this right. is their first real moment of combat and the, the second division holds true wow i i noticed um in in the article that uh one, one of the marines talks about he he makes uh bit of an oblique reference to to the 26 yankee division because in say Chapray or or in one of the raids during that time like there was um a large a rather large number of americans taken prisoner and uh the marine in the article makes reference to that like uh, something to the effect that uh you know we're we're not like that other division that you know that gave up guys um yeah uh so that, that was found found that interesting so that that tells me that they knew that they could get news from what was happening in, in other parts of the front they weren't you know, totally isolated. So the right. Um, well, they would rotate out. You know, rotate out the the units. Um, of course, to the Marines, they would. Uh, can I? I cannot do French pronunciations. At Camp Le, it's the L E V E C E or whatever you would say, L apostrophe E V E C H E. Um, Leves. Yeah, Leves. And the Marines called it Never Rest because. They never really got, uh, you know, an actual rest there because they'd go back and then eventually they'd go right back into the trenches and there was never really a moment to rest. Yeah, yeah, always, always drilling, always, always doing something. That's kind mm -hmm. of the, the life of the soldier. Um, just to go back to that, when when the Marines arrive and you know they get hit with that artillery barrage again for for no doubt well trained, but but still raw troops like that must have been, you know, despite no no casualties other other than some instruments like that still must have been a pretty sobering experience for them of of like this is this is for real now we're we're in yeah. it you know so um now there, well and I, I will say lieutenant richard uh lieutenant colonel richard derby who's the second division second uh, second sanitary train he wrote a great book right after the war uh, called Wait in Sanitary, the story of a division surgeon in France. And I thought his discussion of the Marines and their ideologies going into this, um, he says, from the beginning, our men did not like the trenches. It was not the kind of warfare that appealed to them. Continuous living in the mud with never a sight of the enemy got on their nerves and made them morose, just as it had done in the case of many good men before them. They were impatient for a fight at close quarters. They despised an enemy that kept himself out of sight they despised their blue-coated neighbors for their apparent indifference to the stationary warfare, and they would have ended in despising themselves. 
But in spite of rain and mud, that inner fire kept burning, fed by, fed by the prospect of leaving the trenches when fine weather had established itself. So, you know, just that's the ideology of the, the Marines in the second division. They don't want to be here. They want to fight. And this is really going to test them. So what were what were some uh, more notable German or, or even Marine raids? Um, and, okay. and, and to begin, like, um, what were what were typically some of the objectives of the raid? I mean, like intelligence gathering prisoner, um, you know, snatching, snatching up prisoners, things of that of that nature. Sure. Yeah. Um, the raids at this point are mostly to capture prisoners, to, to harass the Germans. Um, the the reality of it, let me, let me click over my photo to these boys resting. Um, the reality is that there wasn't, you know, no giant push to take the German trenches. Um, instead, you're going to have simple raids that uh, come out disappear um you get men going into the no man's land for scouting parties for three days um it's not heavy but what and some of the notable ones um you know april 1st private uh emil gurkia 82nd company he's the first marine killed in action in france okay um and that he was in a work party and an artillery shell got him you know but after that you you start to really get this moment where the marines are they really want a good fight and the let's see i'm looking through my notes right now to see some of the the best so i have a photo and it comes up several times this is trace of yeah probably say that wrong y'all no, no no you, you got it. it okay this town becomes a, a point of contention with the fifth marines um a ra they germans would raid it the americans would hold it um, and you can see in this image, you can kind of see some of the barbed wire and the trenches that run through the town. Right. So the Marines would repulse the Germans constantly. The uh, really the biggest issue that they dealt with was attack from artillery. Right. The first major attack came on April 12th. The 74th Company, they were resting. They were in barracks. They were sleeping. But the Germans knew of this map. This has been a stagnant area for years. So they know of most of the positions. They knew where it was. And in the middle of the night, when the Marines are sleeping, a heavy, heavy barrage of mostly gas just inundate that, that exact location. Shells go right into the barracks. Mm -hmm. And the men are caught in their sleep. They can't get to their gas masks. It is foggy. And as you've probably discussed, Fog and wet reacts with mustard gas, right? Causes even more burns, and it's in a ravine, so it spreads through this ravine and starts getting the Marines in the woods. And the the men are trying to get out of the barracks as they fill up with gas. They can't get their mask on. Um, and all in all, 220 men were burned or inhaled gas and had to be evacuated. 40 died as a result, and this includes. Two of the corpsmen, the hospital corpsmen, Navy pharmacists, right? You have Fred Schaffner, who hadn't been in the building, and Carl Kingsbury. They both rushed to the site to try to help these men. They weren't in the building. They were just helping the, Mar the Marines get out and helping to, um, you know, bandage them up and help with this. Both men inhaled so much gas just from the clothing of the Marines, that, and they refused to evacuate themselves. Fred Schaffner ended up dying because he inhaled and th again he was not in the attack he was simply helping the marines and he died and carl kingsbury um he was in the hospital for three months three and a half months he was blind for a month but uh he survived and both these men become the first navy corpsmen to receive the distinguished service cross in the war so verdun i mean not only for the marines but for the corpsmen but this number i mean that is a 220 men casualties immediately Right. And after that, the Marines are really going to have to deal with gas as a big issue. But moving forward, um, you end up with like April 17th to 21st. This is when the 96th Company first goes into the line. And this is when they, they make the French mad because they, quote, 
when the dawn came, our men climbed onto the parapets and saw some Germans down by a creek washing their clothing and promptly opened fire, which then pissed off the French, pissed off the Germans. And this is going to start a lot of the issues because within the next two days, the Germans attempt to raid the Marines and, of course, are are pushed away. But out of all of it, I think one of the biggest is uh, on April 20th, the 84th Company are attacked in the middle of the night. And these Germans managed to get all the way up to the trenches, just the first, well, I guess it would be like the second line. They cut okay. through the first line of, of barbed wire. They okay. made it to the second line before someone uh, noticed. And the Marines opened fire and it turned out this was a very large German raiding party with flamethrowers and stormtroopers loaded down with grenades. And they got into the trench and it became hand-to-hand -hand combat with these Marines. And they the Marines attempted to launch signal flares to, to bring down artillery, but they were too damp to fire. Right. And then the Germans opened fire with their own artillery barrage. So two Marines, uh, Privates Sleeth and Hollinger, they had to run through the German barrage to get back to their artillery and then have artillery open fire on the position. So you've got Marines hand-to-hand -hand combat in the trenches, flamethrowers, grenades, artillery on both sides. It's a hell of a battle. But with the artillery support, the Marines did manage to push the Germans out and push them back. And that is one of the, the largest attacks. Now, there's multiple attacks that happen um, to the Marines. They repulse them every time, like I mentioned. But... That one was by far the largest. And then there's another that happens on April 22nd. Um, Second Lieutenant August Sunval, he's actually an Army reservist, um, but he's an officer for the Marines because they needed they needed officers. Interesting. Uh, Sunval leads, yeah, there, there was a period here where you've got Army officers leading the Marine Brigade. You have Army officers leading companies. Uh, just because the Marines don't have enough yet, they're still trying to build up that that core right and so he leads august sunval leaves uh, men of the 18th company fifth regiment into a patrol so about 30 men into a patrol of no man's land and they run into a german working party in the middle of no man's land um but as a uh, one of the marines later i think catlin later says unfortunately for the germans the marine does not count his enemy's number and all of a sudden they open fire and this becomes uh hand-to-hand -hand combat in the mud, uh, bayonets. It's, it's bloody. It's horrible. Sunval is wounded and uh, Corporal Walcott uh, Winchenbaugh grabs Sunval and carries him through the machine gun fire back to the American lines. And he's, he receives the Distinguished Service Cross for this. So there are moments of, of valor from the Marines and Marines are getting DSCs. And the they're fighting the Marine or fighting the Germans as hard as they can because this is their first moment to really test themselves in battle. And it also later comes, I've got a photo. This is the only photo I have of Uncle Tom who I, I really wanted to mention because you normally you hear about the men who get the Medal of Honor, the men who get distinguished service crosses, but what about the men that never get any awards? Right, right. And he he's one of the most interesting. Uh, stories I found that his name was Gunnery Sergeant Charles Thompson of the 83rd Company. And on April 30th, he took two Marines to do a reconnaissance patrol. And that's Private Steinmetz and uh, Dorian. And now they get to the German lines and they find the trench abandoned. And so they get into the trench and as they're walking uh, along the trench trying to figure out what happened, where are the Germans, uh, Steinmetz slips. He slips in the mud and falls down. And he he almost laughed, but as soon as he opened his mouth to breathe, it turned out the Germans were starting a gas attack and the trench was filling up with mustard gas. And so he starts, uh, you know, he can't breathe. He's in the gas. And Thompson, Gunnery Sergeant Thompson, reaches down, grabs him by the belt and hurls him out of the trench topside. And while he's, gra and so while Steinmetz is gasping for breath up top, Thompson dives deeper into the gas and pulls Dorian out of the gas because Dorian's now inundated with it. So now you've got two of these Marines who have suffered, they've inhaled mustard gas and they're on the German side. They're in the German trenches and the Germans know this. And so 
all of a sudden Thompson has to climb out of the trench. He grabs Dorian and carries him over his so his shoulder, and he's grabbing on to Steinmetz, leading them back through no man's land while dodging German patrols. Now he makes it back to the American lines, and Thompson and Steinmetz recover, but Dorian unfortunately dies of the gas wound, uh, inhalation at the at the base hospital. Wow! But he but he brought those two guys back. Like he he carried them back across no man's land while all three gassed. And, you know, he never received an award of this, but, and I think he later was, no, he wasn't killed. He made it through the war, um, but he never received any award for this. But to the men that knew it, it becomes something they tell. They they remember this night. So that's this image of Uncle Tom on the horse shell shock. The horse called shell shock. Yeah, Amazing. of course. So, this there's, is, so there's a lot of moments like that. Of, yeah. Of bravery. But there's really, unfortunately, like I said, it's a quiet sector. So there's not like this massive battle. There are just these, moments of raids either the marines attacking the germans or the marines holding off german raids but you know so um i had a question here that i actually just skipped over because we we've, we've pretty much already addressed it you know it was, what does this article add to world war one history like and, and as i'm listening to you talk about these stories here like it's um this is what this article adds to to world war one history is is even in this quiet sector, like it wasn't exactly quiet. It just wasn't as hellish as an inferno as as Verdun and the Somme and, and mm -hmm. Ypres up, you know, further up in Belgium. Um, but all of these, all of these battles, like that, that you know, the the patrol meeting the German working party in in no man's land. You know, that's that's no less of a fight than than anything in Bellow Wood. I mean, these guys were all of a sudden. You're you're mm -hmm. in a fight for your life, and um, these little engagements that have been forgotten, except by those men who were in them, and you know probably didn't even didn't even get mentioned in in unit histories or no, they, and they never are. Even the second division records, uh, the the full you know the twenty volumes, the German side has stuff from Verdun, but the American side, it's like they didn't keep the records because they don't start keeping a lot of the records in the second division until Bella Wood. So it's almost impossible to find anything on this time in the Verdun sector. And the point of this article was, I mean, I personally, and maybe people realize this from my work, I really enjoy the perspective of the men. I want the little people. I want to know what they thought. I want to know what they went through. I don't like top-down histories. Right? Right. I want the anecdotes. I want to know uh, what's happening on the ground and part of it is yeah there's battles but the reality of war i mean this is a modern war that they're fighting and the reality of the trench life is so new to these men um uh, so part of the i mean a big part of this article is just dealing with trench life you know right. um dealing with constant lice and cooties and there's my favorites they they like to do cootie races where they would take a hot pan and then they'd pick off their lice and they draw a chalk mark on half of the pan, and then two Marines would take lice off their bodies and put them in the pan, and the heat would cause them to jump. And then whoever's cootie won won the race, right? Yeah. Um, so you get you get these these moments where this is the reality, the downtime, the the yeah. the part we don't hear about. I mean, I always found it interesting to deal with the trenches like the rats. How do you right. deal I with was, the rats? I, yeah, I wanted to say that that with that that German raid that you mentioned where they, you know, they cut through the first line of American wire. There's, there's an American, there's a Marine in, in your article that talks about the rats that like, you know, um, when you're on guard duty at night, like they didn't know, like you could hear rustling out, out there in the wire. And it's like, is it a German snipping the wire or, or is it just a big rat, you know, chewing on some, you know, yeah. some forgotten corpse out there. And it's, and that's like, Oh my god like like these little details that you that you don't realize it it makes um this is what the article adds is that it it, it brings these these probably forgotten episodes these forgotten bits of trench life like back to life for for us um and yeah, it, you know, it really gets on your nerves exactly yeah. you, know, you hear this noise all night and i don't know how many accounts i've read of nervous sentries sounding off the alarm because right. they heard a noise there's a rat you know something like that but i think about the nerves 
uh, than how nerve wracking it is to have to sit there in the dark and listen for every little noise and have all of these things come even trying to sleep i mean there, there's so many accounts and i put in here rats crawling across your face or rats nibbling on marines while they slept my god yeah yeah no that's no that's that's like that that's really cool that that this article brings that stuff and and uh you know just to bring it back to the the cootie races like it's, um i mean boy man there's there's a whole lot going on there there's i mean first of all you've got marines in this hellscape you know covered in lice and you know they're making a game out of burning lice to death on a on a frying pan like like that's like whoa man you guys are really removed from civilization you know and and there's a lice hunt lice races and then the rat hunting i always love the discussions of rat hunting because i've seen those pictures of the germans there's one that's really famous where he's uh, he's got all these these skins right he's like right oh my god yeah rat morbid skins. stuff yeah right yeah and you gotta remember that the rats are there and the marines that's that's entertainment you hunt rats so like there's this image this comes from a great book dear folks at home okay um, and you know lots of letters from marines home and you know they they don't run they're huge they are uh constant and so the marines would would hunt them uh one of them joseph joseph rendonel right he said the rats are terrible we can't lay down without them starting to nibble at our legs they are nice and fat from eating dead french and germans and now they want american meat mm -hmm. uh those babies will find it pretty tough i bet uh, and, you know, this becomes a game. And uh, one of my favorites, because he comes up a lot, this image here that I'm sharing, this is Jimbo. He was the, the company mascot for the 67th company. And Jimbo is a rat terrier. So yeah. they would just let Jimbo run loose in the trenches and he would just hunt the rats. And I did find Catlin. He mentions that the uh, one of the units had the term he used isn't a real term. So I think he's referring to an aardvark. You know, one of these animals that the Marines took from the tropics. As yeah, a an, an actual aardvark? Yeah, yeah, they took them with them. One of the accounts on the way home is there's a list of all the mascots, and that includes, like, two monkeys, a donkey, a llama, uh, dogs, and an aardvark. Um, and so the Marines brought their pets, but this aardvark apparently became a very good rat hunter. And so you've got these animals running around the uh, the trenches with the Marines, Never cats. There is an account from a Marine who says this is the first time he's ever seen at night the cats go into no man's land to get away from the rats. Wow. So yeah. you've got, like you said, you're so far away from civilization. You've got Marines and animals in the mud hunting rats and burning cooties while their nerves are shattered trying to wait for a German raid, right. waiting for a moment. Wow. Like, like what, what a world, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. we can, we can kind of laugh at it a little bit, just, just to add some, you know, some levity to it, but, uh, but man, like th think about all of that, you know, like what, what, what that must've been like. And I'm, I'm sure those guys, you know, found, they found humor, you know, with burning lice in a frying pan. Stuff. Yeah, something, you know, you got it. Well, and in the end, what's really important, because of course, I mean, this article covers a lot of stuff, sure. but I think it was really important was at the end, I wanted to talk about the accolades that came from this. I mean, this is a forgotten moment, yet this is the moment that creates the Marine Corps as we know it. Um, while people would love to argue it's Bella Wood, I argue that it's not. It's this moment where the Marines are officially put in as a, as a hell of a unit that they have, they are now tough, they are hardened, and they are ready to fight. And part of that is um you know general harbert when he came in he said that this brigade the fourth brigade is a pattern of soldierly excellence and is a pride to us all and when john pershing when general pershing showed up and inspected the marines in may so after they finally got out because they were okay. supposed to be there for a month right but the spring offensive called french troops away they took the more experienced french troops to help with this, the offensive which then left the marines in the sector for two more months he he arrives in may just after they come out of the trenches and when he walked along the lines one of the marines wrote home that uh quote when we were inspected not long ago by general pershing he asked if there were any recruits in the company the answer was no 
They are hardened Marines. They are not recruits anymore. These are not green men. And they didn't take, you know, enough casualties to need replacements. Right. So there aren't many replacements coming in. There aren't green men. Like in Bella Wood, when those replacements show up in the middle, they are green and Bella Wood is a hellhole. But right. these Marines coming out of it, I mean, they are they are stiff and uh, even the Germans had to give it to them um, in the 10th uh, Landwehr division. In their uh, records, they wrote about the second division that they offered embittered resistance with their machine guns, some even with their bayonet. A great many of them died fighting heroically, right? Even the Germans have to admit that these men are dying heroically. And they also mentioned the Marines, the 5th and 6th regiments, quote, should be classed as units of a somewhat higher value in view of their picked replacements and their better training in the 9th and 23rd infantry regiments. So even the Marines or the Germans realized the Marines were the top group. Oh, okay, right? yeah. And they don't take draftees. So these are all men that come in, they're replaced, they are through the training and the other units, they will take draftees sometimes. Right. But right. the Marines will not. And the one thing that obviously becomes one of the most um oh actually i did want to say this quote is another one um by uh george a gunner marine gunner horace talbot from the mm -hmm. fifth regiment he wrote home the germans who tried to conduct raids etc found out that this division had no intentions of being caught napping and letting a couple of hundred prisoners which is that reference to the 26th division right letting a couple hundred prisoners fall into their hands as the case has been in another sector held by an american division on the contrary all raids against us were a failure and it was the germans instead who left prisoners and material in our hands and failed to accomplish anything against the second right so the marines are proud and but perhaps the proudest which with the myth there is still no evidence where this word it, it was not the germans the germans did not create the devil dog myth right instead it shows up in the newspapers it's the newspaper myth yeah. and so here i've got some of the earliest mentions april 13th 1918 huns call marines Tufelhunde. marines now devil dogs the nickname that sticks to this day is established from verdun now whether it's true and there's a german record no one has found this purported letter of the germans um what is true is the newspaper here but this myth of the devil dogs holds true to verdun i mean they, they held off um long enough and they they fought well enough that they established their position whether or not it is the germans they established themselves in american culture american yeah. myth and belief like this this is it this is the moment and one the it was one of us trying to find some of the earliest references by marines mm -hmm. and one of them was a uh, corporal willard nelligan of the 95th company he wrote home saying um of the nickname devil dogs that's what they call the marines down at verdun here's how we got the name we had our patrols out every night in no man's land down there and kept pestering the life out of them until they thought they would teach us a lesson so they sent a raiding party uh 250 strong to take our trenches and incidentally get some prisoners but we cut them to pieces, and instead of capturing any of us, we captured most of them. They figured it was no use trying to capture any Marines, and they, they then nicknamed us Tufelhunden. Now, whether there's any truth to that, or this is just his story, who knows? No one will ever know. We have yet to find whatever document originally has the name Devil Dogs. But it doesn't matter, because that idea and that identity will shape the Marine Corps for the next 150 years. Oh, absolutely. And to this day, Devil Dogs is still their most uh, treasured nickname, right? No more Leathernecks. Now it is Devil Dogs. Devil Dogs, yeah. And it comes from Verdun. It does not come from Bella Wood. That's that's amazing. And, and for you folks uh, listening to the podcast, um, right here at, at this point, if you're on, uh, if you go to YouTube and watch the video, you can see uh, James is um, sharing uh, two two newspaper articles that are dated April thirteenth. I mean, this is well before um, uh, the fight at at Bellow Wood. You know where where you know the I I kind of believe like uh, you know the Marines were like born there. You know like you know the Marines that we know today. Yeah, uh, yeah. the Marine Corps. Um, so this is amazing. The 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 Teufelhunden name was was already was already out there almost two months before 
Uh, yeah, you know this, but this is. I mean, this is the reality of the situation that Verdun yeah. is important not only because it was the first moment of combat, but because it created the core as we know it and as the Germans knew it. So and this that is, experience is unfortunately forgotten. So this is this is cool because this I think this already this just tackled um, the question that I had was like you know like hey what did the Marines achieve here and uh, you know. What did they learn? You know, I, I had, you know, while not receiving open warfare training as expected or hoped, what did they learn? Well, this is, you know, it, it's everything you just you just mentioned. They this is where the Marines learned how how to become warriors here. So, yeah, um, it's not a tactical victory by any means. They didn't accomplish anything in a tactical sense. There is no land taken. They didn't take yeah. any trenches. They held their trenches, but there's nothing gained except for the experience and their identity and because when they get to bella wood and that switch to open open warfare uh, that i mean that does you're right it creates the marine corps as we know it but those marines would not have been hardened and tough enough to switch if it hadn't have been for what they endured at verdun so amazing amazing this this adds uh more depth to the picture of the of the U.S. Marine at at Bellow Wood, like he he came to that fight with a pretty solid idea of like this is what we're up against. We know who who the who these guys are in those woods, and you know we we know we know we have an idea of, of the effort we have to make here. So um, it's amazing, amazing, James. I'm wondering if would you mind. Um, that photo you had of the guys sitting and eating, would you mind sharing that one more time? Absolutely, yeah. Let me share. Uh, this one. Yeah. Yeah. Can, that's you see, a... can you see the image? Yep, I can okay. see it. Yeah, this is actually, and this is the cover of my little photo album book I published. Um, this is Clarence Douglas here, and this is men of the 96 company. And actually, some of these men will be killed at Bellow Wood. Really? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's an important part of this image. Is some of these men will, will die in the next two months. Um, but, I mean, if you look at I do love the image because you get the trench boots. You, you do. The, the gas mask, the equipment. I mean, eating hard tack. Uh, they just look disheveled. They're muddy. They're dirty. Uh, and you can see all the, the rubble in the street from the town being destroyed. Right, right. So I wanted to bring this, um, I'm, I'm gonna do a little shout out here to to listener uh, Nancy from, from Wisconsin. I, uh, so Nancy, definitely go to YouTube and, and get to this part of the interview because um, Nancy sends me a lot of photos of, of Doughboys and stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, we both talk a lot about um, about swagger, you know, and how, how these, you know, these American boys had a lot of it. Uh, but there's a gentleman in the picture right here standing against the wall with his um with his coat open. He's got a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, you know, leaning against that wall. Like um, you know, he's he, he's the shit and he knows it, you know. Well, this so would be a good moment then to do an old a whole shameless plug, because it's in my book, you ah. know, uh through the eyes of a marine, which you can oh buy on Lulu, but this book is uh, the photo album of Clarence Douglas, that Marine uh, sitting there eating. And he wrote the names of every single one of these men. Oh. And he's also got some of the only known, let me see, these. These come out of there too. So that's Clarence Douglas in the trenches. And those okay. are Marines in the trenches. So he's got some wonderful images, uh, especially the 96 company after the war. But he's got some shameless plug on Through the Eyes of a Marine. Oh, fantastic! Give me um, give if you can give me a link to that too, and we'll add that yeah. to, the, to the show notes. Awesome! All right, all right, James. So I think let's see. Yeah, I think I think we've gone through our our list of of uh, questions here. Uh -huh. so, yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a great section, especially since it's uh, still so open for research. Oh so anyone that wants to dive into it, you, it's it's open. It's there. It needs to be talked about more. Yeah, super cool, super cool. So I, I love how this this adds you know even even more depth to the story. And you've got a 
couple of other projects in the works that we'll be talking about soon that that add a whole lot more to uh to world war one history um so looking forward to to uh, speaking with you about about those yeah. um so that's going to be this is super cool the, the work you're doing man is amazing this is this is well, great man. i didn't even know about your your <clears throat> photo book so oh yeah yeah you know it's uh I've also got one other article, which it, it kind of fits in. It'll be in Leatherneck in January. Okay. But it's on uh, siblings and uh, brothers who fought together in the Marine Corps. And I only picked three. But uh, I wanted to bring them up because uh, there are two groups, um, the Urban Act brothers and the Hill brothers, who served alongside each other at Verdun and then at Bella Wood and went through all of it together. And I, I think that's also one thing to really keep in mind is that there were so many in the Marine Corps, there were so many siblings that joined together and fought either in the same company or in different companies. And they went through this hell together. And so they're always worrying about each other as well as worrying about their, their new brothers that they met through the Marine Corps. Right. And so that article comes out in January in Leatherneck. And I think it's an interesting discussion of siblings and their role in the Marine Corps. Ooh, looking forward to that too, man. Oh, fantastic. All right. All right, James. So, man, it's been a great talk. Um, all right. And we will we will see you here back on the podcast here very soon, man. Very, very I appreciate it. To it. Thanks for having me. All for right. The fourth time. Yeah. Yeah. Rob, we got to we got to figure something out, man. We got to get you uh, caught up with uh, <laughs> with James here. All right. I'm going to stop recording, bud. Okay.